Good afternoon and welcome to the Neuro Ophthalmology session. I'm Dr. Naveen Jayakuma and with me uh, we have uh, Swati Fuljele, Dr. Ambika and Dr. Sachin as well has come on. Yes, we're all set. I just have one change in the schedule. Uh, Dr. Manju Bhatte has another session coming up soon. So I shall call her at number three. Okay? So then we'll move on. So the first talk happens to be mine. Okay. okay we'll invite the first speaker, the president of Indian Neuroophthalmology Society, Dr. Naveen Jayakumar. He's going to talk on when and what neuroimaging. Good afternoon. The topic I was given is about eight minutes of when and what of neuroimaging. Ambika, at seven minutes, just let me know. I'll cut it short. So the goal of uh, today's talk is to describe some uses of CT, uh, what are the different MRI sequences and protocols, and when can we deploy them appropriately in different clinical situations. So I think CT still has use, although a lot of us just talk about MRI, most importantly in orbital disease, in trauma, for example, here you can see uh, bone window CTs, and you can see their details. You can see the fractures of the medial wall and the floor very clearly because CT images bone well. And not only does it image bone well, it can also show you the interior bone structure, as you can see in the red arrow, as an example. Uh, by way of contrast, this is how a normal CT would look, where the bone is entirely white. And this form of imaging, where you can image just the bone part of it, is called bone window CTs. Uh, also used very commonly uh, is uh, osseous lesions of the orbit. For example, here is fibrous dysplasia. You can see that big white patch there on the CT plane, but you can see the interior of the bone uh, here on the bone window. And 3D CT is also useful, not only in this situation, but in craniofacial disassociosis to plan surgeries, etc. cetera. Uh, one very common use of CT uh, is strokes, uh, where you can do it very quickly and decide which way of treatment you want to go, depending whether it's an ischemic or a hemorrhagic stroke. Here, for example, you can see that area of hypodensity and effacement of the sulci, indicating that this is an ischemic stroke. On the other hand, here you can see this hyperdense lesion there, with a complete effacement of all the sulci, include in, which means that this is a hemorrhagic stroke as well. So CT is very good for this kind of a quick uh, diagnosis of which way you want the treatment to go. Moving on, here's a patient with the optic atrophy in the right eye, but if you look clear, closely, you can see not just temporal pallor of the left disc, but you can also see some amount of nasal pallor. This is a bow tie optic atrophy. And that's very typical of chiasmal lesions. And this patient had a pituitary adenoma. I put these pictures up because you can very clearly see all the three views, the axial, the coronal, and the uh, sagittal sections uh, of the brain, as well as T1 images where the fluid, like the vitreous, is dark, and T2 images where the fluid appears bright. And here you can see the pituitary adenoma with supracellar extension pressing the chiasm. Uh, one interesting thing is there, you can see on T1, you can see a little hyperintensity lower. There are very few things which are hyperintense on T1. Uh, so these would be uh, several things here, but most importantly, in this particular case, it happens to be a bleeding into the tumor. So this is an example of a pituitary apoplexy. Uh, so T1 images, to summarize, shows anatomy very, very well. And how do you make out T1? Because the fluid appears dark. Moving on, here is a patient with right optic neuritis. The T1 weighted image shows an iso-intense optic nerve, but on a T2, you can clearly see the hyper-intense optic nerve. So T2 is very, very useful for showing pathology, as in this case with optic neuritis. In the same patient, after injection of contrast, first of all, this is a T1 weighted image because, as you can see, the vitreous is dark, and we use contrast on T1 images only. And you can see that area in the yellow dots where the nerve is enhancing with gadolinium. Okay. So contrast, of course, shows pathology very well. Remember, it looks like T1, but you can see these little dots representing blood vessels that will give you a quick clue that you're looking at uh, a contrast image. Also, the extraocular muscles look very bright as well. 
So same patient, you saw that um, uh, hyper, hyper, uh, iso-intense optic nerve, but you can see on T1 the fat is hyper-intense, but on T2 also in the kind of acquisitions we take nowadays, the fat starts to look bright as well. So it's not very clearly seen uh, the hyper-intensity of the optic nerve on T2 images, but if you can dim the fat that you see here, you suppress it, then you can see the nerve very, very clearly. These kinds of protocols ending with the letters IR, as you can see there, stand for inversion recovery sequences. So this is a spur image, which is a fat suppression. So that's convenient to show orbital pathology and also skull base lesions. Uh, here, another suppression image, we'd like to uh, suppress water in this case. This looks like an almost normal looking T2 weighted image, but if you suppress the ventricles fluid CSF, you can see a periventricular MS plaque. So flare images, once again ending with IR, this is fluid attenuation inversion recovery, suppresses CSF, shows brain pathology very well. In optic neuritis, don't forget, which sometimes we need to take recourse to spinal uh, M sequences as well, apart from looking at the brain and the optic nerves. Here you can see small segments of involvement in the spinal cord, suggesting multiple sclerosis. Conversely, you can see an extremely long segment involvement here in neuromyelitis optica. That also helps you to differentiate between the two conditions. This one is called LETM, a longitudinal extensive transverse myelitis. Uh, now coming to uh, PCA infarct, let me show you some pictures here. So on axial flare, uh, this patient, you can see bilateral occipital lobe lesions. One side is looking hyperintense, the side on the right is showing mixed signals and also looking a little hyperintense. So here you can see if you do diffusion weighted image, you can see clearly differences between the two sides. Decreased diffusion, looking brighter, indicating acute infarction, and increased uh, diffusion, indicating an old infarct as well. So diffusion-weighted images are useful in early diagnosis of stroke. Uh, this is a patient with a sixth nerve palsy, and as you can see, she has uh, aneurysm here. So always in cranial nerve palsies, you need to do an MR angiogram as well. This shows a giant intracavernous carotid aneurysm. So all cranial nerve palsies, hemifacial spasms, any vascular lesions, don't forget to do this. In this patient with papilledema, uh, don't forget to first check the blood pressure. But classically, in IIH, you see widened perioptic spaces, the empty cellar, and don't forget to do an MR venogram where you can see hyperplasia of the sinuses, dural venous sinuses. So that's important for MRI plus MRV in IIH, presumed IIH cases. Uh, my last sequence is an extremely bright T2-weighted, uh, like looking picture. This is called a cis or a fiesta image. You can see the cranial nerves in the subarachnoid space. See the right seventh nerve and you can see the left one there. But next to that, that's the seventh nerve and you can see this anomalous blood vessel loop. So this patient had a left hemifacial spasm. So these are SSFP sequences called going by different names according to different machines. But they're very useful in looking at cisternal segments of the cranial nerves. So in conclusion, choose the appropriate modality. CT has its uses in orbit trauma, acute stroke. MRI is useful for soft tissue imaging. It's important for us also to be familiar with MR sequences and protocols. And always talk to your radiologist before sending the patient. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Navin, for setting the tone there for dealing with the most important investigation in neuroophthalmology. We'll take questions after two talks. So I next invite Dr. Varshni, who would be talking about now very important, another very important investigation in neuroophthalmology, OCT, and what role does it play in our day-to-day -day practice? Yes, sir. Uh, yes. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this um, talk. So I'm going to be presenting about OCT and is it essential uh, for neuroophthalmologists. So um, uh, looking at the type of OCTs which we get, these are the four different machines, four different printouts which we are reasonably familiar with. However, they differ in scanning protocols and segmentation algorithms and the measurements are not comparable uh, between one and the other. What do we actually look at when we look at an OCT? 
We look at an optic nerve head analysis. We look at a peripapillary RNFL analysis. We look at a macular ganglion cell analysis. And again, this is what differs from machine to machine. When we look at this uh, segmented OCT of the uh, macula, the three layers which we are interested in is the ganglion cell, its axons, and its dendrites. And uh, the various, um, the cirrus HD OCT um, gives us, as a GC IPL, it gives us a combination of ganglion cell layer plus IPL layer. Whereas the OptoView machine gives us the thickness of the RNFL, the ganglion cell, and the IPL. And for this reason, we cannot compare between the machines. This is the printout which uh, we are used to um, seeing. And uh, we can get a lot of information uh, from this, mainly about the retinal, uh, about the RNFL layer. If we look at, we also look at, always need to look at the ganglion cell analysis in combination. And at this point, I'd like to point out that there are two different scales um, which are working over here. So when you look at the RNFL thickness and the ganglion cell thickness, uh, yellow and red are thick, which is what gives the RNFL thickness the characteristic butterfly um, shape, and the ganglion cell layer the characteristic golden donut um, shape. And when we are, but when we are looking at the RNFL quadrant wise and the ganglion cell uh, sectors, then red is thinning and green is normal. So coming to the most common conditions which we see in a neuroophthalmology OPD, um, optic disc edema. Optic disc edema occurs uh, when the intracranial pressure is transmitted uh, to the subarachnoid space, uh, flattening the posterior sclera, causing an axoplasmic stasis and pushing the optic nerve forward. This can be visualized on an optic nerve, uh, on an uh, OCT, um, as RNFL thickening, as we see in the uh, right eye. Um, we can also visualize the other signs, which is um, the absence of the optic cup, the increase in volume of the um, optic disc as well. And uh, retinal nerve fiber, uh, sorry, uh, retinal folds can be visualized as peripapillary wrinkling, which is a very specific sign to differentiate between optic disc edema and pseudoedema, uh, maybe due to optic disc drusen. Um, this um, OCT is extremely helpful to differentiate mild optic disc edema from pseudoedema, but what happens when you have uh, repeated optic neuropathies and uh, optic nerve thinning? Then we get something called a floor effect, which means that there is so much structural damage that further thinning or thickening can no longer be appreciated. So in cases like those, for example, in a patient who's had uh, multiple attacks of IAH with subsequent optic atrophy, then also the OCT is quite helpful. In which case, we look at the Brooks membrane, the shape uh, of the Brooks membrane in, um, along with the reference plane. So in a normal patient or when the uh, ICT is normal, the Brooks membrane would uh, have a flat appearance or a V-shaped appearance. When the, uh, as in the second picture, when the, um, I, uh, when the pressure increases, then this Brooks membrane is pushed forward towards the vitreous, forming an anterior deformation or a D-shape. Once this pressure is relieved, once again, the Brooks membrane comes back to its normal um, position. The second most, condi uh, second most common condition which we encounter in the OPD is optic disc drusen. Now that we know that drusen is not merely an um, incidental finding or a benign pathology, and frequently with the ears, it leads to progressive, uh, becomes more superficial with RNFL thinning, ganglion cell loss, and progressive uh, visual field loss as well. So we do want to detect uh, drusen as early as possible for prognostication. So fortunately for us, the Optic Disc uh, Drusen Studies Consortium has uh, given us these guidelines on identifying Drusen on OCT. Uh, so Optic Disc Drusen are always located above the lamina cribrosa. They have a signal poor core with a hyperreflective margin, which is usually seen superiorly. They may be seen as conglomerates of smaller ODD with internal reflectivity. Uh, hyperreflective horizontal lines might represent early ODD, but are not actual uh, Drusen. And peripapillary hyperreflective ovoid mass like structures, which may be present in other forms of edema as well, should not be identified as Drusen. We can currently say that um, uh, EDI OCT may now be the gold standard instead of B scan ultrasound because it offers us several advantages. It helps us in quantifying Drusen size, um, has a higher uh, detection rate. Uh, correlates with the visual field effect and monitors progression as well, as well as measuring progressive RNFL and ganglion cell loss. Coming to the next condition in optic neuritis, this is a patient who presented with bilateral optic neuritis enhancement of both the optic nerves, the chiasm, and the right optic tract. With treatment, uh, the optic, uh, the visual, the vision normalized as well as the visual field. 
However, when you look at the OCT, compared, uh, comparing the initial to the final, we can see that the R level, there is mild R level thinning, but significant ganglion cell loss, which is visualized even better when you do a progression analysis. So extremely helpful in these cases. It also helps to identify the amount of RNFL loss, also may help to identify associated conditions. For example, optic neuritis associated with NMO has much more significant RNFL loss compared to optic neuritis associated with MS or um, single episodes of MOG associated optic neuropathies. Um, this is a patient with an optic nerve sheath meningioma. You can see the disc edema in the right eye. And you can also see the um, RNFL thickening associated with the ganglion cell thinning, which can be used to monitor progression and further loss. Um, in toxic optic neuropathies as well, you can see a thickening of the RNFL along with thinning of the ganglion cell layer, which may be one of the early signs to indicate toxicity. In um, chiasmal uh, lesions, you have compression of the binasal, fig uh, binasal uh, fibers, uh, which shows up as bitemporal hemianopia, but can also be seen as binasal thinning um, on the ganglion cell analysis. Um, Retrochiasmal lesions, which were initially thought not to cause too many OCT changes, now we can see that the pattern is reflected on the ganglion cell layer. So if you have a left homonymous uh, hemianopia, for example, in the right eye, if you have a nasal um, field loss, then you will have a temporal um, ganglion cell loss. And similarly, in the left eye, if you have a temporal loss, you will have a nasal field loss. Uh, sorry, nasal ganglion cell loss. And I will uh, wind up by uh, just adding a comment on OCT A's. There are some conditions where OCT A is also extremely helpful in neuroophthalmology. This is a patient with chronic IAH uh, whose vision was not improving beyond 6-9, but when you do an OCT A, you see that there's a frond of new vessels due to a peripapillary CNVM. So it's uh, extremely helpful in identifying these conditions as well. I would like to sum up by saying uh, OCT has revolutionized management of neuroophthalmic and neurologic conditions in diagnosis, disease monitoring, as well as prognostication. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vashni. Uh, there's a small change here because Dr. Manju has another session to leave. So we'll take her talk first, followed by the uh, questions. Right? Dr. Manju is a faculty at LVPI Hyderabad. And she would be talking about um, how to diagnose and manage ocular myasthenia gravis, which is a condition I, which is confounding, I think, to most of us. Unless you have some proof there, it is a difficult condition to diagnose. Over to you, Dr. Manju. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you AIOC and the uh, chairpersons for including my talk in this session. Um, so I'm going to talk of a topic which is generally of grave concern to us, uh, which is ocular myasthenia gravis. And this is because we first, it's important that it's to know that it's a diagnosis of exclusion and that we need to rule out sinister causes before considering treatment, uh, starting treatment in this. So I'm going to take you through uh, some of the myasthenia and also coupled with a few cases as well. So basically, it, as we know, it's an autoimmune disorder of defective transmission at the neuromuscular junction. And ocular myasthenia gravis is isolated extraocular muscle involvement for more than or equal to two years. <clears throat> the incidence is 1.7 to 30 cases per mil million and the prevalence is 77.7 .7 cases per million. This is US data. Of this, 10 to 15% of all myasthenia gravis are pediatric, and juvenile my myasthenia is one to five cases per million. So what's important to also know is that ocular myasthenia in juvenile is 10 to 35%, and the rate of progression of ocular to generalized uh, or ju uh, generalized in juvenile is three to eight to 33%. So as we know, the path pathogenesis involves binding of the acetylcholine receptors by the autoantibodies, which are the IgG autoantibodies. There is complement-mediated damage, and there is destruction of the ACH receptors on the muscle membrane. In, ad in addition, there's also receptor muscle-specific kinase, that is the musk receptors, which are also affected by the autoantibodies, and also the LRP4. This is more in pediatric myasthenia gravis, that is a low density, lipoprotein receptor related protein and the agrin. There's also a role of thymus in myasthenia gravis. That is when there is thymic hyperplasia, we see there's autoreactive T cells which cross react with the antigen and produce autoantibodies. So thymectomy has a role in ACH receptor positive myasthenia. So this is kind of a brief overview. We'll go back and forth 
but we'll uh, look at a case once. So this is a 39-year-old female. She came with drooping of the right eye. She did give history of variability, and on a uh, detailed history, she, uh, we did come to a conclusion that it seems to be more towards the end of the day. She also had associated diplopia, which was uh, noted for 15 days. The vision was good in each eye. I'll come to the nine gaze, but she had limitation of elevation, also a little bit of adduction and abduction. Um, and after ruling out uh, our standard cranial nerve paresis or a common differential diagnosis. She was uh, tested with pharmacological testing. Her ACH receptor antibody titer was positive. There was no thymoma on HRCT. And she was started on myosin, 60 milligrams, with tapering steroid regimen. So this cycle was repeated twice. And as we can see here, she has the ptosis. There is limitation of elevation in all straight up gaze as well as the right and left up gaze. A little bit of adduction, abduction uh, limitation. She had a left hypertrophy of 14 and an esotropy of 12. After starting her on a combination of mes uh, my, uh, mestinon as well as uh, tapering steroids, uh, she did improve, but that mild ptosis, which you can see in the primary position, the center photo persisted. <clears throat> she was orthotropic. And this went on for six months, and then she was switched on to immunosuppression, that is steroid sparing, azoran. Uh, 50 milligram twice a day, and then she's completely symptom-free at a further follow-up. So this, I'm showing a follow-up of one year, but all these patients, be it adult onset or juvenile, are going to need pretty much a very long-term treatment regime. So myasthenia is something which at some point, at, after the diagnosis, we need to explain very carefully to the patient that what it involves over their lifespan. So what's important is the variability in the clinical features. That is the variability of ptosis, the diplopia, the limitation of ocular motility, and there is no specific pattern with regards to which cranial nerve palsy it may mimic, stimulate, or it may not fit into any, and also the presence of Kogan lit twitch. Just sitting at the office, we can do simple tests like fatigability when we see the uh, ptosis increasing on prolonged upgaze, an ice pack test or a rest or a sleep test. And the third test is quite important even in children because <clears throat> they may not tolerate an ice pack or may not cooperate for a fatigability test. The pharmacological tests, as we know, are the edrophonium, then the anti-ACH receptor antibody titer, anti-musk antibody titer. Usually we order a combination of both. And the nerve fiber stimulation, that is the electrical test, either the repetitive nerve fiber where there's a decremented response after three to five stimulations or a single fiber electromyography. The management algorithm, as we know, is either the, uh, the paridostigmine in or combination with steroids. At some stage, a steroid sparing agents like a mycophenolate, azathioprine, or a tacrolimus should be considered. So also plasma pheresis or IVIG, this is individual case-based. And depending on the response that patients uh, do um, uh, show us. Thymectomy is more, I would say, um, a valuable as a treatment option in seropositive uh, ACH receptor uh, uh, test. So here, by knowing all this information, we kind of know that there is variable sensitivities of the various tests in literature. There is different uh, presentations as well as progressions in seronegative as well as seropositive cases. And also the effect of various therapies may or may not be the same in all the patients. So we tried to do a study uh, and looked at 285 suspected myasthenia patients, 121 confirmed to be um, myasthenia based on either of the diagnostic tests, have written the inclusion exclusion criteria. And, um, and looking at these tests, we came to know that the age of presentation was a slightly higher in males, so also the gender was more in noted in males. A small percentage was pediatric and most were bilateral cases. Uh, then looking at our results, ptosis was the most frequent. Uh, limitation of motility was also noted in 61% of the cases. And generalization more in zero positives was noted in 13% patients. So in this, we come to know that the edrophonium or the neostigmine test in our study was 8% uh, observed to be positive in this cohort of patients. And also that pyrostigmine and steroids was the most uh, used treatment modality. 
um, in managing these conditions. So also a small number or a sizable number, I would say, needed immunosuppressions. <clears throat> so here we come to know that the pyridostigmine with steroids gave a 61.5% improvement. Thymectomy patients tended to be poorly controlled. So I've not gone into every detail of the study, but we've got fairly interesting findings. I'm just going to wrap up in the next one to two slides. So there are major differences we note in adult onset versus pediatric onset myasthenia, both with regards to ethnicity, the myasthenia conversion that is more noted in adults than children, the zero negativity, which is fairly common in children, and also the EMG findings. This is gold standard in both. Whereas in children, we tend to have a step ladder management approach with using st uh, steroids, then steroid sparing uh, agents. And there is more remission in prepubertal myasthenia than postpubertal. So again, I'll quickly run through this case. This simulated a fourth nerve palsy, but this patient was already on treatment. He then came with variable ptosis when we started tapering the vice alone, and then needed immunosuppression over time to have his entire disease under control. So this really needs a lot of individualized approach. And uh, to conclude, it, myasthenia is a mimicker. Congenital prepubertal is often seronegative, and EMG is needed to prove. Genetic diagnosis is important. I didn't go into the genes, but there is a number of genes, especially in the pediatric myasthenia. A step ladder approach, and it's important to know of refractory cases and early switching to immunosuppressives. This disease requires a multidisciplinary approach, so it's not ophthalmologists, but also the physicians that need to be involved. Um, I'll conclude with this. This is a slide where I'd like you to save the dates. July 20 to 22nd, we are having an international pupil colloquium at LV Prasad Eye Institute. I'll share the details later. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Manju. Uh, we have some time, so we can take a couple of questions for the first three talks, if there are any. Uh, Dr. Manju, I just have one question to you. Yeah. When do you recommend that uh, other antibodies for myasthenia, like agrin and there are okay, so many so the, newer antibodies yeah. which so are the, in the literature? The NRP4 more so in any um, uh, patient presenting with myasthenia less than 18 because these are more often seen in the pediatric or the juvenile myasthenia. As a routine for adult myasthenia, I would do both ACH receptor and anti mus It kind of comes as a package. Uh, test which is offered by most laboratories around our institute as well. But we can talk into most labs for getting it done. So both these for sure. And then switch to electrical tests to try and get a confirmatory or a gold standard. I wouldn't, I don't routinely look at LRP4. It's not easily available in all labs. Uh, Dr. Sachin, your comments please. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, LRP4, I have very rarely used it between a combination of acetylcholine receptor antibodies and single fiber EMG, you will get your diagnosis in most cases. Uh, the one thing that I emphasize is the rest test or the question asking your patient, do you have ptosis upon waking up early in the morning is probably one of the most sensitive questions you can ask. Yep. Uh, if the patient has myasthenia and say, it's not there when I wake up in the morning, then it, it kind of supports the diagnosis. But if they wake up with ptosis, it's unlikely yep. to be myasthenia. True. Sure, please go ahead. We do neostigmine test, yes, in, in adults. So it uh, uh, starts with a 10 milligram. I can tell you the entire. Oh, so the diagnosis, so that we are doing in cases of myasthenia which have the ptosis, to look at improvement of the ptosis after injecting the neostigmine. It's 10 milligram. Uh, no, we inject without atropine, but we have an anesthetist standby. We do it in the operation theater. Thank you. I just have one question to Dr. Varshini. Very good talk, Dr. Varshini. I just have one doubt that you recommended EDI OCT is being more used for uh, uh, ODD, for optic drusen. Like, is there any uh, condition where we can miss uh, drusen even on an EDI OCT? We can definitely miss smaller uh, drusens, ma'am. 
Uh, and also, I think it depends on how uh, comfortable you are with analyzing the um, AEDI OCT. Because we get multiple radial images, so you really have to sit on the screen and go through them one by one. And, but I think it is a learned skill which we should all acquire. Because uh, obviously getting a B-scan ultrasound is much more tedious. <laughs> and uh, Dr. Sachin, your opinion on this Brooks membrane opening role in chronic OCT? Like, do you use that as a screening tool? Because uh, IIH and or chronic IIH and the role of OCT in it is quite, I mean, not that great go in then. And when once there is a GCL loss, it may be very difficult for us to use that as a great tool. So you're talking about the, the deflection of the hmm. Brooks membrane anteriorly or posteriorly. Uh, yes, the answer is yes. I do use it, but not, uh, not on its own. Um, so you have to put it in the context of the patient presenting with low-grade papilledema, and then the cases where I find it very useful are if there are radiological corroborating factors. So if you already see a flattened globe on the MRI scans, and if you see anterior deflection of the Brooks membrane, then it is very likely that the intracranial pressure is high. Um, it is not clear how long it takes after the ICP goes up for this deflection to become uh, you know, visible to us. And it is also not clear how long after the ICP is normalized for the Brooks membrane to angulate posteriorly. But I do use it in conjunction with the other, uh, other parameters. There are a few case reports of it going down immediately after a lumbar puncture. I haven't seen it personally, but there are uh, documented reports uh, with the angling being seen very well before the lumbar puncture and then a few hours later with it flattening. Yeah, so I'm aware of those case reports, but I'm not aware of any large case series where, or even you know, a large number of patients where they clearly say how long it takes. The problem we have in clinic is when I send a patient to get the lumbar puncture and by the time they come back, you don't know if the ICP has gone back up or not. We also don't know the exact relation between starting acetazolamide, how long does the pressure, how long does it take for the pressure to come down, what's the pressure rate at, uh, what's the rate of decrease of the pressure. And when we see them back in clinic, if the uh, Brooks membrane is still angulated anteriorly, we don't know if this is a chronic effect versus uh, the true pressure at this time. And that's the reason why uh, uh, these uh, non-invasive measures of ICP has really not picked up is because there is no one parameter that can, that can be proof. I also have a question, uh, Dr. Vashni. Have you tried using OCT for a recurrence of uh, raised ICT? For example, a patient has had IAH and has resolved dyskidema. You have tapered off Dimox and about to verge mm -hmm. on the stopping it. But if there is a recurrence, because there is already an atrophy there, maybe the disc swelling may not be so apparent. So is there, have you tried using OCT in those cases? So we do do uh, serial OCTs while the patient is on follow-up and on Dimox, and even after stopping the Dimox a few months later, because I use that to record a baseline, maybe three months after stopping the Dimox, and if it has not recurred till then, then I use that as the new baseline, because many of these patients tend to have a residual RNFL thickening, Correct. even though the visual field has resolved, and it just stays at that level, so I'm assuming that is the new normal and then use that as the baseline to look for any, any uh, subsequent episodes. So any increase in thickness of RNFL after you have stopped the Dimox, you would consider that as a kind of record? So depending on how much of a thickening there is, I would definitely keep a closer watch. If it is like a significant thickening and it is varying, then yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you all. We'll move on to the next speaker. It's my pleasure to invite Dr. Sachin Kedar. Professor of Ophthalmology and Neurology at Emory. Uh, his talk is going to be My Vision Fades Out, Visual Disturbances from Migraine. Good afternoon, everybody, uh, and uh, thank you uh, to the organizers for inviting me to this uh, subspecialty conference today. 
uh, I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. The goal of today's talk is to discuss the differential diagnosis for a patient that presents with transient visual disturbances, especially in a patient with migraine. And since these are common in the community, all of us will have these patients in our clinical practice. So I'll start with a patient that I recently saw in clinic. This is a 30-year-old young patient with a two-year history of visual disturbances. She has a past medical history and a family history that is strongly positive for migraines. Two years ago, she started a new job, which increased her stress levels, and she's noted that there has been an increase in severity and frequency of these episodes. She also tells me that she hears a heartbeat in a year during these episodes. This is the key of the issue. You have always have to ask them details of these visual disturbances. What do they mean by it? So this patient tells me that she has this vague blurring of vision, and then her vision pixelates out, which means dot by dot, it just disappears over three to four minutes, stays dark for about 10 to 15 minutes, and then it slowly pixelates back over three to four minutes. The whole episode lasts for about 20 to 25 minutes. During these episodes, she has managed to cover one eye and she figures out that it is only one eye at a time. Occasionally, these episodes are triggered when she stands up, but what she has also noted that most of these episodes are followed by a dull pain around her orbit and the head, which lasts for about one to two hours. So when I examine her in clinic, it's completely normal. This includes visual functions, visual fields, fundus photos, OCTs, and even tomographic sections through the macula, which does not show any evidence of recurrent ischemic episodes. So at this time, in this age group, the most likely cause for the visual disturbances is an aura from a migraine. But what I want you as an ophthalmologist to recognize is that this is a diagnosis of exclusion, and it is important to document a normal examination in between the episodes. What are the other possibilities? The other possibilities are cerebral ischemia, occipital seizures, retinal diseases, and papilledema from high ICP. Patients with cerebral ischemia will describe an abrupt onset of vision loss, and depending upon where the localization is, it can be a hemianopic kind of a visual field effect. Typically, the episodes will last for about 60 minutes or so, and then in some patients it will persist, and in others, if it's a TIA or a transient ischemic attack, it will resolve. Occipital seizures, on the other hand, have an abrupt onset and offset. And remember, the occipital lobe has no way of formed visual hallucinations. So these people will have unformed visual hallucinations in the form of geometric shapes, pinwheels, circles, multi it could be multicolored, monochromatic, lasts for less than a minute, never more than five minutes, and it's usually localized to one hemifield depending upon the localization of uh, the lesion. They may or may not have altered sensorium and they may or may not have automatism, so don't rely on that. Retinal diseases, especially in a patient who says, I see a curtain-like effect coming down on my visual field. Remember, retinal traction can cause lots of positive visual uh, phenomena like flashing lights. Retinitis can do it, retinal ischemia can do it. And of course, patients with papilledema can have transient visual disturbances with postural changes when their vision blacks out for a few seconds and then it comes back. So everything is in the details of these episodes. So our patient had another episode where she had slurred vision for 15 minutes, where she went to the ER because her colleagues were worried about a stroke. She had a full stroke workup and that was all normal. So the diagnosis is migraine with visual aura. It is very common, one in every five individuals, one in five women, and one in 10 men will have migraine. And of these individuals, a third will have some form of aura, and more than 90% of these aura are visual in nature. The classical aura in migraine is that scintillating scotoma right in the center of the visual field, which then gradually spreads outwards in a whirl fashion, forming the fortification spectra. Patients can have positive phenomenon or negative phenomenon where they have loss of vision, but usually patients will perceive it in one eye despite the fact that the pathophysiology is a spreading cortical depression. Less common presentations of uh, visual aura in migraine are perceptual, 
Patients can describe kaleidoscopic or a a cracked glass appearance. They can have multiple images. They can have uh, persistent images are called palinopsia, and about 15% of patients will have Alice in Wonderland effect where they will see images being distorted either bigger, smaller, further, or closer than they are. And then there is this phenomenon of visual snow where everything in the background appears to be pixelated with fine dots like snow. It is important to observe these patients with visual aura because they have a higher incidence of cardiovascular disease particularly those who are smokers, those with diabetes, the perimenopausal women with hot flashes, and those on hormone replacement or estrogen uh, therapy. Uh, there is an increased odds of developing major uh, uh, cardiovascular diseases in this population. This is a take-home slide, one of the take-home slides. These are the red flags for your patients with migraine. So a patient can have migraine, 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 but they can also have some other pathology. Always look carefully at your patients who are older. If your patient presents with an aura above the age of 50 years, it is not migraine. Think of something else. Patients with risk factors for cerebrovascular disease, patients with a history of epilepsy, traumatic brain injury, a family history of epilepsy, or other kind of neurological insults, it's more likely to be uh, a seizure than anything else. Patients who have a side-locked aura or headache, which means it occurs 100% of the uh, times on the same side. In migraines, patients will often come and say, well, it happens on the right side, but if you press them, they say, yeah, 10% of the time, it also happens on the left side. Abrupt onset and offset can indicate either ischemia or seizures. If it's persistent, which means lasts more than 60 minutes, think stroke. If they have a unilateral or a bilateral hemianopic pattern that persists after the event, think of, uh, of, of uh, a structural uh, pathology. A curtain-like effect and presence of altered sensorium or automatisms. So remember, when you see these patients, you document a normal neuroophthalmic examination, which includes a normal ophthalmic examination. There is really no treatment for these auras at this point time, and most of the therapies for migraines are geared towards headache. There's some limited data that lamotrigine may actually help these patients. So partner with your neurology friends. They will rely on a normal examination from you prior to initiating therapy. So thank you for your attention, and if you have any questions, I think we'll take it after the next talk, right? Okay. Thank you, Sachin. to the next uh, speaker, uh, Mahesh. Okay, we can move on to Dr. Mahesh Kumar, the head of neuroophthalmology department from Arvind Eye Care. He's going to talk on optic neuritis, how you investigate and manage. Good afternoon, I thank the organizers for having invited me here. I'll be speaking on opt optic neuritis and overview of diagnosis and management. So we'll start with the case presentation with a young woman presenting with one day history of decreased vision in the left eye associated with pain worsened on eye movements. The visual acuity in the left eye was uh, 6 by 60 with a decreased color vision and a relative afferent pupillary defect. There is a central scotoma in the left eye with normal optic disc in both eyes. So presumptively make, we make a diagnosis of an acute retrobulbar optic neuritis and uh, any uh, retinal bone neuritis, presumed optic neuritis, should always undergo a neuroimaging, uh, ideally with a MRI scan of the brain. And in this case, this patient had certain classic findings, which are called as, uh, which are hyper intense lesions perpendicular to the uh, peri per perpendicular to the ventricles. You can see these are all called Dawson's fingers, hyper finger-like projections, and uh, periventricular lesions, which are hyper intense. And also there are some lesions, as Dr. Uh, I mean, Jake Mar Sir showed there are some lesions, scattered lesions in the spinal cord, which is suggestive of a multiple sclerosis. But remember, these spinal cord lesions need not always be present. And uh, this classic uh, multiple sclerosis has these sort of uh, Dawson finger like, -like pictures and hyperintense lesions. So, what the original optic neuritis treatment trial said 
uh, which was conducted 25 years back, they said that the visual outcome of the acute optic neuritis is usually excellent with or without treatment. And uh, high dose IV steroids, they said that it accelerated the visual recovery but did not affect the final outcome. But there, are, there has been so many modifications since then and we no longer have to follow the typical optic neuritis treatment trial and we need to understand what is typical and what is atypical optic neuritis. So what, whatever we have seen so far is the typical optic neuritis and whatever is atypical is age more than 45 years but not necessarily more than 45 years. It can also be less than that. If it is bilateral and simultaneous optic neuritis in both eyes, pain may be absent and uh, it, disc edema may be present in both eyes. And the clinical course in the case of a typical optic neuritis is described as spontaneously recovering after three weeks. But in this case, atypical, it may not recover within three weeks of onset and after 30 days, it may still not improve and even worsen with uh, treatment or without treatment. So this condition of atypical may be steroid dependent or uh, steroid sensitive. For example, steroid dependent in the sense that once we withdraw the steroids, these patients can go down again. And steroid sensitive meaning that these patients can have a sudden visual recovery with just one or two doses of IV methylprednisolone dramatically recovering. And we should be very suspicious of these conditions that they may recur again. These are all highly suspicious for recurring optic neuritis. And in these conditions, workup may reveal other systemic conditions apart from multiple sclerosis. So we'll go to the next case. Uh, which may uh, which may be typical of a, which may show a atypical optic neuritis. This is a young female with a decreased vision of both eyes of one week duration. She also had a burning sensation in both the lower limbs and a straining micturition. So the visual acuity is light perception in both eyes with the mid-dilated sluggish pupils in both eyes because of the optic nerve involvement and the there is a bilateral optic disc edema in both eyes. You can note that this disc edema is not florid disc edema. It is a just mild degree of disc edema which is uh, less likely to be a papilledema, as well as the fact that the visual acuities have gone down acutely also will uh, make us think a diagnosis other than papilledema, and in this case, it's an optic neuritis. This patient also had a exaggerated deep tendon reflexes. Uh, these tendon reflexes were examined because of the uh, paraplegia she had and the straining micturition. So she had this uh, enhanced deep tendon reflexes. And in this MRI scan, this is a normal MRI scan, which again was showed in the first presentation. You can see the central optic nerve surrounded by the CSF. This is a typical T2 fat suppressed image, which is a normal uh, optic nerve sequence in a coronal section. You can see here this central nerve is replaced by a hyper intense lesion throughout which means it's an hyper intense intensity of the optic nerve suggestive of an acute optic neuritis in both the sides and in this case the MRI also showed what uh, uh, Dr. Navin Jaikumar showed a long longitudinally extensive optic uh, spinal cord involvement suggestive of a diagnosis of a neuromyelitis optica or a Devix disease so this is as of now we have these biomarkers of neuromyelitis optica antibodies, which we'll be seeing. So uh, typical optic neuritis can fall into a typical clinically isolated syndrome or a multiple sclerosis, whereas atypical optic neuritis, which we just saw, could fall into a neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorder, which can be aquaporin-4 antibodies, which are water channel proteins, uh, antibodies against this in the brain tissue, and antibodies against this are called neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorders, and myelin oligodendrocyte associated antibodies, which are called as MOGAD disease. So there are also other auto-antibody mediated disorders, like anti-glial fibrillary aseric proteins. These antibodies also have been described, as well as uh, newer antibodies against which biomarkers have not been available as set in India. So there are certain typical uh, neuroimaging features which, may, which can make us suspect, apart from the clinical findings which we had discussed, these neuroimaging features can make us suspect uh, that these could be atypical optic neuritis, like uh, extensive optic nerve involvement, more than 50% of involvement of the optic nerve, and more posteriorly involvement, and more chiasmal involvement of the optic, uh, chiasmal involvement of the neuritis. Uh, all these can suggest that possibly this is an atypical optic neuritis, suggestive of a neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorders. Uh, this is a very classical uh, description, illustration, showing the different uh, types. In multiple sclerosis, you can see a small segment of the optic nerve which is being involved, and scattered, it may involve scattered uh, spinal cord involvement. 
In neuromyelitis optica, it, is bi it can be unilateral or bilateral, more posterior segment, more posterior optic nerve involvement and possibly a chiasmal involvement also and this extensive longitudinal segment involvement as well as other locations where these antibodies are concentrated in the brain and the brain stem. And this is for MOG, MOG antibodies, it can be more anterior uh, location and these um, uh, spinal cord involvement can be more uh, uh, caudal. So yeah, as far as the treatment is concerned, typically we have to treat them with uh, IV methylprednisolone for three to five days. Five days is preferable. We can no longer follow the original ONTT treatment trial. We cannot afford not to treat them with any steroids. And uh, if it is uh, severe, if it is not improving within two days or so, we should consider referring to a neurologist for possible plasma exchange and with along with uh, uh, immunomodulators like uh, IV rituximabs. And once these patients have recovered, we should always slow steroid taper to avoid a recurrence. And awaiting, we should await the lab, lab reports. And uh, with seropositive neuromyelitis optica, we should consider immunosuppression with the help of a neurologist. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mahesh. If there are any questions for Dr. Sachin Stork and Dr. Mahesh from the audience. Ramesh, yeah. It's on. Yeah. Just wanted to know your kind of uh, when do you start flex in this kind of patient? Because uh, we personally see it is giving a very good response. It's just that uh, it's very expensive for most of the patients. What is your uh, threshold for starting flex? So ideally, if there is no improvement in three to three days at least, if there is absolutely no improvement uh, in our area of practice, we do not have facilities or plex that is a uh, that is a reality so what we do instead is we immediately refer to our neurologist in uh, in occasional instances and uh, uh, he continues five days of iv methylprednisolone and then he gives iv rituximab so that is what is our uh, practice pattern because of the availability of lack of ability of plex in our region all right thank Excuse you me. Uh, sometimes cost is a consideration for us so can you avoid doing aquaparin 4 and MOG antibody just seeing the neuroimaging that there is no extensive involvement? Uh, if the recovery is good and if it follows the typical pattern, we, can, we need not do in every case if the cost is, cost is a real factor. But we need these antibodies to determine the long-term immunosuppression because we cannot justify long-term immunosuppression uh, without a lack of concrete evidence of these antibodies. So in that context, we may need to definitely do these antibodies so that we are justified in giving long-term immunosuppression. Both? Both, both yeah. Bo mm -hmm. Usually it is done both together in a package uh, by the labs and uh, that way it is most, uh, it is cheaper for the patient as well to do it combined. Thank you. I think this was a question that was raised earlier at the INOS meeting about whether we should do a uh, MOG and NMO antibodies, considering they're particularly expensive in many situations, and one of the solutions provided by one of the neurologists was, yes, you can take the blood before starting the steroids and, and save it in the lab, and then you can go ahead with the steroid treatment, because treatments for uh, the steroids will change the antibody testing result uh, if you try and test it afterwards. So it's easier to take the blood before and save it, and when the patient can afford it, probably you can do the tests. I have a question for Mahesh, sir. Yeah. Sir, how do you plan the evaluation for uh, pediatric optic neuritis? Um, okay. Blood workup and uh, right. all these atypical workup. Yeah. So uh, nowadays what we see is typically pediatric optic neuritis is bilateral and that's what we see in most instances. And uh, uh, almost immediately we send for a uh, NMO and MOG workup. And many instances we get it positive, MOG positive, almost every other case. That is what we are seeing. We are not sure at this stage whether it is really a false positive that because that concern also is there for us about false positivity in mock. But pediatric, we almost do it for every case, almost. That is our threshold. Thank you, sir. So, uh, but the association of mock uh, and pediatric optic neuritis is, uh, is common, no, sir. So yeah. literature says that. Uh, yes, it is. 
It is, and it's coming out to be positive also. So how do you plan the treatment, sir? How, do you put them on immunosuppressants or... Uh... Yeah. So we always manage these patients in, uh, in uh, collaboration with the neurologist. We refer to the pediatric neurologist and uh, he gives them immunomodulators, immunosuppressants. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mahesh. Good afternoon, sir. This is um, my question. take last question. Yeah, yes, yes, sir, please. Ahead. Sir, what if the patient is allergic to IV methylprednisolone? Because we had a 31-year-old female who was allergic to IV methylprednisolone. Uh, so we work in coordination with the neurologist, sir. We have referred the case again. I mean, they have seen and they have put, uh, they have, uh, uh, put them on uh, oral uh, steroids. But what if... Uh, I, I, I think uh, allergy per se to the methylprednisolone is rare and possibly it's due yes. to the preservatives, sir. Oh. and other things. That's what I think. Yes, sir. Considering so, it to be rare, I just wanted to pose yeah. the question. So, uh, we have not uh, so far had any, any of this issue, mm -hmm. but probably I might think of switching to oral steroids if that situation ever arises. Yeah, or, the same has been done in fact. Yeah. Yeah. Or probably, I mean, it's too far-fetched to say that those days we used to give retrovar uh, steroids, mm -hmm. dexamethasones or something like that. We can think, think like that, but oral steroids will be a better alternative, but I'm not, I'll take mm -hmm. other panelists' opinion on this too. Can we thank, consider thank you, sir. plex in such a situation? Can we consider doing plex early in such a situation if we have someone who is allergic to uh, oral steroids? Doctor. Uh, sorry, steroids. Doctor, what, excuse me, what was the allergic manifestation you observed in that patient? Rash. might not be allergy to the drug itself is what I would think. Thank you, Mahesh. Uh, I'd like to invite our next speaker, Dr. S. Ambika, who is the head of the Department of Neuroophthalmology at Shankar Chennai. She'll be speaking on IIH treatment strategies. Good afternoon, all of you. First of all, let me thank the organizers for this opportunity. Well, I'm going to talk on IIH treatment strategy. So IIH is no longer a benign condition and it can cause a permanent vision loss and a chronic headaches. But main goal of the treatment remains in alleviating the symptoms and preserve and restore the vision. So early medical treatment and weight reduction can save vision in typical IIH, but there is a lack of consensus as which best surgical approach would you choose in a refractile IIH. And weight gain is the main known risk factor in a typical IIH and also its recurrence. So the IIH weight uh, hypertension trial has also discussed about the options of trying bariatric surgeries in the effective management of a long-term typical IIH. And you all are aware of this Dandy's modified criteria, which is the diagnostic criteria to make the diagnosis of IIH. So this is a nice infographic summary what you can use for your patient, uh, uh, patients. I have given the reference. This is a very nice chart which you can use. Here you could start identify that as the diagnosis of papilledema, do the optic nerve function test, and always check blood pressure when you see a bilateral disc edema and confirm that you're dealing only with a papilledema. And if it is going to be then escalated to a neuroimaging, and in case of IIH, there's always you need an MRI brain in orbit with contrast with an MR venogram. So without MR venogram, do not go ahead and treat a so-called diagnosed IIH. So rule out a other venous anomalies before escalating to the lumbar puncture. And depending on the CSF opening pressure, ruling out the secondary causes, you can plan the treatment for a typical IIH. So the management strategy is, as I mentioned, it's to protect the vision and then manage the underlying disease. So if there is a classical weight bearing, uh, I mean, uh, the rep reproductive age group and overweight female, go ahead for weight reduction and then continue the IH management. And what type of manifestation? If the headache is quite severe in a presentation, you concentrate on the headache management. But if it is a typical IIH, generally they have a very chronic nature of visual loss, unlike the atypical IIH, which you have to be very careful because that can move on to this group of fulminant IIH very faster. So these group of patients are the one you have to keep in close follow-up 
you can put them on a temporary lumbar drain if you're going to plan the surgery. And if you see a very fastly escalating vision loss and a visual field loss, go on for a CSF diversion procedure or a sheath fenestration, depending on the facilities available in your center. So I'm going to start with a case, which is a 26-year-old female. She, in fact, was an ENT doctor. She presented to us with 20 days old of drop-in vision, gradually worsening. She apparently had a food poisoning after one of her department get-togethers, following which she developed this. And she was diagnosed to have an IAH locally, and she was put on Diamox. She was on 500 milligram uh, daily dosage and a small dose of oral steroid as well as topiramide when I saw her first. She was a moderate built, non-obese female, and her vision was normal and color vision was normal. But when I could see the fundus, this was the disc appearance for her. She had a significant disc edema. Already there was a pallor setting in with a hemorrhage. And the, this was the visual field where you could see that there is definitely significant peripheral loss in both the eyes. So the OCT showed almost an RNFL thickness, which is almost beyond 300 plus in both the eyes, and some amount of ganglion cell loss you could see over here. And uh, MRI brain and orbit revealed a normal, I mean, uh, it showed uh, classical IH features like perioptic space widening and empty cell love. And apparently the MR venogram was normal, and her spine screening also was normal. So she, we went ahead and did an LP, which showed a CSF pressure of almost 300 millimeters of water. So we told probably you're having a chronic papilledema, which is escalating now. So we may have to increase your dose of Diamox. After the neurologist and neurosurgeon concurrent opinions, we went ahead and did this. We called her after four weeks, but she turned out after six weeks. And you could see there's a visible reduction of a disc edema in both the eyes when we escalated the Diamox to two gram. And this was a visual field. There was a significant improvement in the visual field indexes after the escalated Diamox dose. And this is three months follow up and she remained 6, 6 and 6. And now we stepped down the Diamox to 1.5 gram per day as she had some difficulty in taking and her visual field still remained having few peripheral defects. So this was a pre-treatment OCT RNFL thickness you can see here. But you can see there's a definite RNFL uh, thickness lowering, but there is uh, also a progression of the ganglion cell loss on the macular cube, what we saw. So this one study in Neurology 2023 had shown some prognostic factors. So they did a longitudinal prospective trial, and they found 98% of their study population were female, and the highest OCT RNFL layer had the worst visual outcome. And a change in BG BMI had definite impact on the treatment options, whatever you choose in a chronic IIH. So we also had done this way back in 2010. We did an R Indian population. We studied almost 106 patients, and 50 of them fulfilled the criteria. And we found that most of them were less than 50 years. And all of them had a I mean, significantly normal vision on presentation. And 98, 92% had bilateral presentation, normal MRI, and an early, blind, early uh, enlarged blind spot as a presenting field effect in most of the eyes. Only 18 eyes had a visual acuity of less than 660, where as they presented quite late in the disease onset. So they had a vintage papilledema with a grossly dropped visual fields. At that time, we escalated these patients. Apart from medical treatment, we had to give the other options of surgical interventions also. So topiramate can be considered as a second line of management following Dimox, and particularly when there is a headache as a presentation, most of the neurologists do prefer. But remember the red flags of IH, a male patient, non-obese, venous sinus disorders, any blood dyscrasias, and drugs, you have to watch out for the, these are the red flags, where they may not fall the classical IH presentation. And there are a lot of drugs which are coming up in the literature, like exenatide, which has been used to reduce the ICP, and it has also shown improving in uh, symptoms. But venous sinus uh, stenting has got an increased popularity when it is associated commonly with a Atypical IIH, when you see an venous sinus stenosis, you have to consider for the stenting in addition to the CSF diversion procedures. And the dual benefits of weight loss and ICP reduction with exenatide have increased its role and probably it promises for the future management options for IIH. With this, I try to conclude and I like to invite you all for the sixth annual Indian Neuro Ophthalmology Society meeting, which is going to be held at Shankar Netralia, Chennai. Hope to see you all in Chennai. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ambika. I'll take a couple of questions from the audience, if there are any. Yes, sir. Uh, 
Dr. Ambika, I just want to know seriously, how do you exactly plan the diamox? To what dose to start with, when to step down or taper up, and how long to continue? Please. I think that is too subjective because this patient was on a mosquito dose of diamox by the time I saw because she's having a significant visual field involvement and already chronic disc edema with pallor and vision is almost any time and this is the first time I'm seeing her. So I do not know whether she's going to respond because my next step is going to be the surgical advice if she's going to grossly drop in vision. So these patients, if you're going to have a good vision, good visual field and you're the first time you're advising no MR venogram abnormality, probably you can ask the, um, uh, I mean again, if your neurologist is going to advise a lumbar puncture, see what type of CSF pressure you're going to encounter. If you're going to have a very gross disc edema with a very high CSF pressure, most of the time they may start with a, like somewhere between one gram to 1.5 gram. And it also depends on whether your patient is able to tolerate it. But usually they start with 500 and they gradually increase the dose. That's the pattern what I have seen. Particularly, you can tell your neurologist if there is no gross visual field deficit. But if, like this patient, if there is a gross deficit, most of us would agree that you may have to increase the Dimox. Since our patient was already on a 500 milligram for a longer while, we escalated gradually within two weeks to two grams of Dimox. That's and how we plan. How long you wait to tap, taper it down or step down that? If my visions, all optic nerve functions are maintained, probably I'll give a very gradual taper. I may not taper it very sooner. And whether she's in a typical IIH, like obese, motivate for the weight loss and follow them over maybe six months to a year. I have seen patients of more than two, two years also on Dimox, where we give a very slow taper, provided they are maintaining their vision and the visual fields. And the continuation of Dimox? Since That's what, if, you have, if your patient is going to have, maybe you increase to the dose, if, the, if you see visible reduction of the disc edema, vision is maintaining, feels is maintaining, you can gradually pull them off the Dimox. It's too subjective, doctor. And the dose differs whether the patient is over, overweight or not, it's not normal. Maybe I would uh, depend than that, if whether the nature, the vision drop has happened in her. If it's a typical IH also, if I'm seeing in a very chronic stage, I may not advise to go with a small dose of Dimox for a longer period. I may escalate to a higher dose. Maybe if, my, if I'm going to plan for the surgical procedure in a shorter interval, I will also advise for a lumbar drain and keep, keep her in a watch and then immediately flip over to a surgical treatment rather than keeping a chronic Dimox dose. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Ambika, was this patient uh, IAH or do you think it was something else? Actually, she, we thought her she had some meningism features because she presented acutely with a food poisoning and that was the trigger which we had. She had a CSF which did not have any meningitic mm -hmm. uh, nature and at that time she to told me that yes, one year back one of my uh, neurology friends had told that I have subtle disc edema mm -hmm. and that's when we asked like, you are already an ENT doctor and how did you let go that there was a subtle disc edema? She said, Madam, I didn't give this as a great importance, but after the food poisoning, she really worsened down a lot. Maybe that has made her, uh, made her worry about her vision. Yeah, so it is, it is relatively common for people to have triggers after upper respiratory tract infection or even GI bugs, and we think it's some form of subclinical aseptic meningitis. In aseptic meningitis, your CSF is going to be clean. You don't find anything, but the inflammation has caused the ICP to go up. Uh, in these patients. But the answer to one of the questions is the dose of acetazolamide, I don't, uh, it doesn't depend upon the underlying cause of the papilledema, it just depends on the visual function uh, at presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ambika. Moving on to the next speaker. So next, uh, I invite uh, Dr. Ramesh Kekunia to uh, deliver his talk on hereditary optic neuropathy, what is the latest? Thank you so much uh, for this invitation and uh, having me today. Uh, most of these patients, uh, they come in India, 80% of the patients come at uh, 15 or 18 or 20 years of age, saying that they are not seeing well in both eyes. They already had one or two MRIs. Uh, they are just uh, put on a diagnosis of optic neuritis. 
So let's find out how do we really genotype and phenotype these patients. Uh, these are my disclosure, none of them are related to this uh, particular talk. So when you see uh, various shades of gray, there are important patterns, what you see in this slide, temporal pallor, bitemporal pallor, asymmetrical temporal pallor, diffuse pallor, and chron elevate, chronic elevated ICP, especially in IIH patients. And then also we have to think of retinal abnormalities. Before we put somebody on hereditary optic neuropathy, I think these patterns has to be. This is a, also a part of phenotyping. And then you know some of this classic glaucoma kind of looking optic disc with those kind of inferior altitude and field defect. You know the phenotype. It's 90% HI, hypoxic, ischemic encephalopathy. Because hereditary optic neuropathy has to be reached the, you have to reach at the diagnosis by excluding all of those. What are the classic non-syndromic hereditary optic neuropathy? Three types of typical types of mitochondrial DNA mutations in LHON, dominant optic atrophy, one, four, five, eight, and the six and seven are recessive, and then X-linked OPA2 and OPA3 uh, dominant with cataract. These are the types. And this is what you see in terms of inheritance and functional gene. In terms of uh, you know, functional gene, Wolfram syndrome, we call it as Didmore syndrome. That's not at the real nucleus. It's because of the abnormality of the function of the endoplasmic reticulum. Same with LHON. It's because of the maternal mitochondrial cytoplasma. Through this, you get the inheritance. Why am I showing this is, you need to know by looking at the patient, what type of genetic test you need to really order. Is it the whole optic uh, atrophy profile or do I want mitochondrial profile? Because both of these are different. And then there are plus disease like uh, MIGS, MELAS and other things where you will have other phenotypic presentation. You can see uh, bilateral is 80%. This is one of the publication from us, probably 10 year old. We did not have so much of genotyping facility at that time. You can see most of them are put under the diagnosis of idiopathic. I'm sure most of that idiopathic is probably hereditary unless you put the diagnosis into uh, taking the genotype variation. This is one of the 19 years old boy, typically comes with diminution of vision. Very big clue on IDDM, on insulin, you know immediately, you know what you are looking at. And then similar complaints in elder patient who had cochlear implant. On further probing, because many of the endocrinologists who are treating this juvenile diabetics, they miss this Didmore syndrome component till very late. Unless, because it's very difficult to diagnose diabetes mellitus and insipidus. So his vision is typically 2080, 2000, and these are other parameters you can look at. And then when we did the genetic analysis, sure enough, he had the WS1 plus uh, pathogenic, it is an autosomal recessive. So this way you know where the diagnosis is going, and this is one more patient with the nystagmus, similar complaints in the elder brother. As I said, the typical, their vision is 2080, 2000, and he had OPA1 uh, mutation, because these are all typically known from phenotypic and genotypic uh, correlation. So when should I suspect genetic etiology? This is very important when you have temporal pallor, nystagmus, strabismus, bilateral or uh, symmetrical vision loss, associated deafness, diabetes, and ataxia. This is very, very important. Unless you go beyond your eye, it may be difficult to diagnose. And uh, in children, nutritional can happen because some of them can be junk food eaters. Some of them would have had any kind of uh, gastrointestinal tract problem. They can have this. So you should suspect in these kind of uh, situations and these are the typical tests what we order. 
For me, the most important thing, and still it is not practiced widely, is the family history and the pedigree chart. That can really tell you a lot of clue and associated diseases. If you ask these two questions, your phenotype is most of the times done. What is left is a genotype. And also, all of this does not fit into one criteria. If you see a face like this, immediately you will see the optic atrophy is not hereditary. It's probably because of the premature closure. If you see uh, this kind of boat shaped, you might be looking at osteopetrosis. And if you see this optic atrophy with the peripapillary changes, you are even seeing uh, things like calcification on the optic nerve. This is what it can be even meningioma. So this is one more patient. You can see gradual drop of vision in both eyes. Vision is severely affected. This is the uh, optic atrophy on both sides, VEP and MRI showing. And this is typically after optic neuritis, their medication, three, four ophthalmologists would have seen, and then it's too late. It's a diagnosis of LHON, uh, point mutation in uh, G1177A. We studied the Indian profile of uh, mitochondrial heterogeneity in this publication. This involved patients from all parts of India. We have very minuscule number of classic three mutations, 14.8% and 2.6% of 11778 and 14484. It just amounts to only 26% of the, the overall thing. And uh, this is the LHON treatment studies which have been done. Recently, the Edimenon, they gave a trial within six months. That is the first study. They saw significant improvement. Second study, the Rodos OF you, you are seeing at the bottom. It's whoever had vision loss for more than one year, they have given Edibinon. They saw significant improvement. Gene therapy, there are three studies. All of us should know. One is rescue trial, one is reverse trial, and the third one is reflect trial. All of this have shown significant rescue is within six months, they gave this medicine. 71% of the subjects showed significant improvement. Reverse trial is after one year of onset of LHON they gave, 76% of them showed significant improvement. And reflect is after one year, whether the sustainable improvement in the vision was sustainable over a period of time. They followed them up for a long period of time. They saw this, this is ongoing, this reflect trial is still ongoing. With regards to uh, Didmore syndrome, there are many things have been done still under clinical phase, metabolic uh, treatment mainly aimed at IDDM and also valproic acid, the liraglutide, these are also endoplasmic reticulum, because the problem in Didmond is endoplasmic reticulum. They are also uh, giving calcium stabilizers in this patient, and these are all going, and also at the preclinical phase, the gene therapy is going for this rare uh, syndromic group. In summary, I would say phenotype and genotype correlation is the king. Even in that, phenotype is the most important then add the genotype, do the genetic counseling because most of these patients come to you for having problems in the license, send them to rehabilitation, send them to low vision care, but also do this correlation, systemic association, drugs mainly I would start them on edibinone if they come early presentation, better the treatment uh, effect and also reflect on reverse rescue and reflect trial and rehabilitate and also try to release like finding the dory. Thank you very much uh, for your kind attention. And I would like to invite you all to this World Congress, wonderful meeting, it's gonna be in Kuala Lumpur. If many of you are um, interested, you can come and uh, enjoy this meeting as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ramesh. We'll move to the last talk and then take questions. So the last talk uh, is by Rashmin Gandhi. He will talk about optic disc pallor and whether it is always neurological or not. 
small correction from my side, it's last but one talk. We have all anticipated the final thing is the keynote address by Sachin on AI and ophthalmology. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, AIOS and the organizers for a very kind invitation. So I'm going to modify my title a little bit to say that what should we do next when we see a patient with uh, a pale disc? So the, the first thing, I think one of the slides is missed. Uh, the important uh, question that we may face is a person who has come for routine checkup for a press biopic correction, for example, uh, no symptoms or complaints pertaining his vision. And when we look into the fundus, uh, we find that the disc appears pale. So how do we determine whether that pallor that we are looking at is, has, is significant or what should we do next? So one thing which can help is if the patient is carrying any past medical records and if there the disc appeared different, then you know that what you are seeing now is, is a, a new finding and has to be chased. Uh, sometimes, if uh, the optic nerve function tests are normal, pupil is normal, color vision is normal, no abnormality on visual fields, and the past medical records are not available, or they, they, they show a very similar picture, then you know that maybe you are dealing with uh, a pale appearing uh, optic disc and not really a optic disc pallor because of a neurological cause. And why that can happen? The appearance of optic nerve can be influenced by the lens status. If patient has a nucleus sclerosis, the disc may appear a little uh, dark. But if the patient has a pseudophakia or a clear lens, there might be an appearance of a bright looking disc. Same with the examination technique. Um, how bright your ophthalmoscope is also can influence the color of the optic nerve. And of course, as I said, the final confirmation can be from the optic nerve function test. And if uh, all the optic nerve function tests are normal, maybe you can just observe these patients. Occasionally, when you are still in dilemma, uh, OCT can help you. If uh, OCT shows an equivocal or a, a thinning of the RNFL, you know that maybe that pallor has to be chased. So in nutshell, scenario number one, Pale disc, but no problem at all, no visual symptoms, optic nerve function tests are the way to go, and then observation. Now what about the second scenario? The, uh, this is a, a, a hypothetical uh, picture of a 25-year-old male who has a gradual visual loss in the left eye for the last six months, and you know that the disc is pale. So now we are looking at a pale disc in the setting of a gradual vision loss. What would you do next? And this slide I have taken from Dr. Navin Jaikumar, where the second thing, of course, the first important thing is after optic nerve function test, look at the visual fields very carefully. And you know that the affected eye has a generalized reduction of sensitivity or complete wipeout of the visual field. But what is more interesting is you see this supratemporal defect in the right eye. So this patient has a junctional scotoma. Uh, lesion location is optic chiasm. So patient who has gradually progressive loss of vision and a pale disc, has to be investigated because there is a progression of a vision loss. So the pathology which has caused the pale disc is still there and is progressing and may cause a devastating problem in the other eye as well. This patient uh, turned out to have pituitary adenoma. So uh, pale disc and a progressive loss of vision, apart from compressive vision, it can be a nutritional or as Ramesha had uh, shown very beautifully, uh, a type of hereditary optic neuropathies. Case number three, uh, a little older patient, sudden painless, sorry, not uh, painful, pa uh, painful loss of vision. Uh, she woke up with uh, this visual loss uh, in the morning four days ago, and when she presented, this is how her affected eye looked like. So you see that even in an acute phase, not only there is uh, edema, but the disc is already infarcted, so, or is going to be infarcted. So there is a pallid disc edema. 70-year-old female, painful loss of vision, and optic uh, pale looking disc right in an acute phase, you're probably dealing with a sinister variety of ischemic optic neuropathy associated with uh, giant cell arthritis. So uh, appropriate history of uh, whether patient has a migrating polyarthritis, the joint pains, the, the weight loss, fever, and jaw claudication would help you to determine whether patient has uh, this uh, uh, arthritic ischemic optic neuropathy, ESR, CRP, platelet, and other investigation would help. The other eye, uh, ischemic optic neuropathy, rarely even the non-arthritic ischemic optic neuropathy can have a segmental hyperemia and pallor. So other eye may give you a clue. In non-arthritic anti-ischemic optic neuropathy, the other eye will show a disc at risk, a small disc with a small cup. 
while in an arthritic variety of ischemic arteriopathy, you'll find a normal cup in the other eye. So that's the pale disc with uh, acute loss of vision. The other scenario, which was partly covered by Ambika as well, is the pale disc with blurred disc margins. Uh, your probable causes are compression, raised ICP, and ischemia, and appropriate administration would help you in these patients. So in a nutshell, if you, uh, if you encounter a patient with a pale disc, it can be neurological, but it can be non-neurological as well. What are the steps to determine whether it's neurological or not neurological is to first step is to say whether it's really an optic atrophy or just a pale looking disc, direct uh, history and examination, common etiologies, imaging versus observation and laboratory evaluation. Some of the uh, patients you may not be able to explain as to why this patient has a pale looking disc and these are sort of a list of tests. This is not an exhaustive list. There are many more tests that one may have to do to determine the cause of pale disc. Uh, this uh, was covered by Ramesh again. Uh, optic atrophy in young, there are three clinical settings. Optic atrophy with generalized white matter disease like adrenal leukodystrophy. Seemingly unrelated systemic features like OPA1 gene mutation or isolated optic atrophy like uh, autosomal dominant recessive or mitochondrial. There are some of these uh, congenitally anomalous discs which can give an appearance of either a, an elevated disc or a pale disc. Uh, and you will have uh, these uh, signs like small disc diameter, absent central cup, or vessels arising from the central apex of the disc, or anomalous loop, uh, and a, non, a no superficial capillary telangiectasia, there, which may tell you that you probably are dealing with something which, is, uh, which patient is born with. Myelinated nerve fiber can be confused either with a disc edema or a pale looking disc. Uh, and also buried drusen, as you see here, Patient can be either uh, confused as having a, a disc edema or the disc also appears pale. But you know that the smaller vessels on the disc margin are uh, very clear. That tells you that there is no true axonal edema. So if you see a patient with a pale disc, uh, first thing is to establish a structural diagnosis. Is, that, is there any problem with the optic nerve? And these are the optic nerve function tests that you'll perform. And these are the probable etiologies. Uh, like optic nerve function test, the blood vessels and the, the pale disc can be because of a problem with the blood vessel or the retina, uveitis, or a systemic association. All of this, apart from a neurological cause, which we know of, can produce uh, either an elevated disc or a pale disc. I thank you once again. Thank you, Rashmin. If there are any audience questions for the Rashmin's talk and Dr. Amesh's talk. <coughs> Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Rajiv, you know the list, uh, there are one point is uh, hyper-pneumatization of the sinuses. Uh, recently, I have got one patient, one eye optic atrophy, and with neuroimaging, it, I have got this thing. Do you have any uh, idea of what to do and how to follow up, and what about the other eyes, how to tell that the other eye is absolutely fine? No, I don't have any personal experience managing this patient, but I, I'm happy if Anybody panel in the has. panelist or anybody in the audience? So are you talking specifically about the pneumatization of the sinus, or are you talking about a pale disc? No, the uh, diagnosis was pneumatization of the sinuses with constriction of the optic canal, and that eye was optic atrophy, actually. I don't have any experience with that, no. Actually, we had a couple of cases presenting to us with unexplained pale disc, and then when we started exploring what is the reason for the drop in vision, so if it is a child, because I had one child presenting like that with a narrowed optic canal, and then after doing few CT cuts, we came to a suspicion that it could be a PD, a pneumosinus dilatans. And that patient had an asymmetric narrowing of the optic canal to explain that side optic atrophy as the reason. But I mentioned that uh, this is the first presentation. We do not know whether there is going to be an ongoing optic neuropathy and a narrowing of the canal. So we kept the patient on a serial observation. And uh, the ENT and the neurosurgeon who has been following along with us, the child, they had watched the child over a period of time. He had a stable vision. Step. So if the vision is stable and you don't have an incidental finding of a pneumosinus dilatans and an optic atrophy both in a picture, probably we can watch. But we had another patient who had a progressive worsening of the vision, and there was a canal narrowing. So we had to go through a neurosurgical decompression of the canal. A neurosurgeon performed that. And that patient had an asymmetric vision stabilization. The one which had a very profound drop did not show a recovery. But the other, other eye, which had a milder drop in vision, 
did stabilize after the decompression, but it has to be done only with the expertise of that canal decompression because the procedure per se can affect the vision further. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, it's my pleasure to invite Dr. Sachin Kedar once again to deliver the keynote address on a topic which is of great interest and current relevance, which is artificial intelligence in reference to ophthalmology. Once again, a, th a, a big thank you to the organizers, Rohit, for inviting me to the Neuro-Ophthalmology and Strabismus uh, Subspecialty Day. Um, if memory serves me right, I'm back at AIOS after exactly 20 years. The last time I was at AIOS was when it was held in Varanasi in 2004, and I think that was the year that I left for the US. So thank you again for the kind invitation. So this talk has nothing to do with neuro-ophthalmology. It deals with my other passion, which is to see how our healthcare is going to change in the future. In this talk, I will review the digital revolution and the impact it's having on healthcare, review our current state of preparedness for incorporating digital health and AI in clinical practice, and end up with a small curriculum that will help all of us who are digitally illiterate to improve our knowledge about these incoming tools. Now, by way of conflicts, I have to acknowledge that I'm not a computer scientist and I have no expertise in AI or any of these technologies, but I'm a medical educator and I have collaborated with a lot of people who've got expertise in this area and I can see it is something that is in our future. So the digital revolution started in the middle of the last century with the invention of the electronic transistor. And this resulted in a shift of data storage from mechanical and analog devices onto digital devices. So within a few decades, you see this massive proliferation and, and adoption of computers and digital record keeping technology. In fact, I bet each and every one of you has a supercomputer in your hands right now. The impact of this digital technology on the world can be gauged by the fact that as of January 2024, two thirds of the entire globe had access to the internet through their digital technology. Now healthcare has been quite slow on the uptake, but we've seen this gradual shift from paper-based records to electronic medical record systems. In the US, this was accelerated by certain legislative bills in the late 2000s, namely the Affordable Care Act and the High Tech Act, which promoted electronic medical records. And as of a few years ago, more than 90% of all hospitals and 80% of all outpatient offices had electronic medical records. What about India? So the government of India established standards for electronic medical records in 2016. And from what I hear, increasingly a large number of uh, practices are moving to electronic medical record systems. This is an editorial in the Indian Journal of Ophthalmology by Dr. Santosh Honavar a few years ago. And I must acknowledge the contributions of ophthalmologists from big centers within, our, within, within India who have participated in the creation of electronic medical records that are targeted specifically for ophthalmology. Now this is the kind of innovation that will spur use of these systems in the future. Digital health, what do we mean by it? So digital health refers to the use of any kind of information and communication technology in medicine and health professions to promote health and wellness. In the US, the FDA has expanded the scope to include mobile systems, health information technologies, wearable devices, telehealth, and personalized medicine into digital health. Now, the electronic medical record is not merely a, a repository for all health information. In fact, most advanced health record systems are communication tools where you have continuous flow of information between the various members of the healthcare team as well as the patient. And in the future, it is anticipated that patients who have wearable devices like Fitbit and other health devices will be connected to the ele electronic medical record systems. 
So what does this lead to? It leads to data overload and bloat. A few years ago, it was estimated that more than a third of the entire global stored data, which was estimated to be about 44 zettabytes, to give you an idea, that is 1,000 raised to the power of seven, is healthcare related. And healthcare data is the sector of highest growth with a compounded annual interest rate of 36%. I wish my CDs would give that kind of a rate of return. That would be enormous. Now, on an average, every single year, a patient is estimated to generate 80 megabytes of data. And this includes not only patient information, but also imaging. In ophthalmology, we rely so much on imaging, fluorescent angiography, OCTs, fundus photography, visual fields, and so on, but also radiological images. What are the practical implications of it? So in the US, which I think has the most advanced electronic medical record system in the world, a study was conducted at UPenn, University of Pennsylvania, where they looked at about three million patient charts and estimated that the mean word length of a patient record had more than 50% the word count of William Shakespeare's longest written work, Hamlet, and most of it is duplicated. So if I had about four or five of these patients in my clinic, good luck to me because I'll be reading Hamlet three times over in a day. It also has important practical implications when you're providing care. At the Mayo Clinic, they observed the ICU doctors and they had to sift through 50,000 data points to pick out 60 data points, which is one in 1,000 important, that was critically relevant for providing care. So if you're an ICU doctor, you have to sort out through all of this data when your patient is urgently sick. This is a typical patient that I might see in my clinic when I'm asked to consult upon. I have to go through hundreds of progress notes, lab tests, and imaging results to provide a consultation in less than one hour. There is another type of information overload that all of us are being subject to, and that is the medical research. So Denson, in 2011, estimated that the doubling time of medical knowledge was about 50 years in the year 1950. By 2010, it had reduced to three and a half years, which means a medical student, by the time he graduates, the medical knowledge would have doubled. And he estimated that in 2020, it would be 73 days. Now, I'm not saying all of this is important and relevant to us, but it is information that we will have to deal with. And at some point of time, it will completely overwhelm the cognitive capacity of the human brain. So I hope you all understand that at this time, there's a very critical need for tools which will help us manage data and information in healthcare. And, and, and this is where predictive analytics and learning methods come into vogue. Now, these technologies have been available for a long time and are being used by other sectors in industry, and we now are learning about it. So what is artificial intelligence? So the, the, the committee set up by British Parliament defines this as technologies which have the ability to perform tasks that were otherwise considered to be purely human. These include visual perception, speech recognition, decision making, and language translation. There are various tools. There are machine learning tools, there are deep uh, learning networks, there are robotic process automation and language processing. The most important or the most famous one, I should say, is chat GPT at this time. Now, I won't go into details of these, but these are going to be very important in our future practices. All of this has happened to us within the last 10 to 15 years. So the scope has been revolutionary. The pace and the scope of this has been revolutionary. And economists are already predicting that we are now in the fourth industrial revolution, which will see a fusion of all of these technologies and blurring the lines between physical, digital, and biological sp uh, spheres. So these disruptive technologies are artificial intelligence, robotics, IoT, 3D printing, nanotech, and biotech, and these are all going to be increasingly become a part of a practice, and it is very important that we are aware of these. 
So how is it going to impact healthcare in the future? So the consulting firm McKinsey has predicted that one third of all routine work in healthcare can be eliminated by a collaboration between humans and smart machines. The silver lining to this is that the potential for automation is lower for health professionals who have daily, uh, who have expertise and direct contact with patients. So I think for now, our jobs are well secure. If you've been paying attention to research in medical field, you have seen this sort of explosive growth in the use of artificial intelligence and technologies in virtually all parts of medicine. This is the kind of exponential growth that we have to deal with. And ophthalmology has not been far behind. So every part and every sector of ophthalmology has been tested by artificial intelligence and similar tools. If you think the machines are going to come in the future, no, the machines are already here. In the US, the FDA maintains a database of all AI and ML enabled devices that have been marketed. And as of December 2023, there were about 692 of these devices, the vast majority of it in the area of radiology. Ophthalmology has about nine approved devices, but remember, we were the ones that ushered this phase with the AI use in diabetic retinopathy screening. So now that I have scared you enough, are we ready for this? And the answer is, we are probably not ready, but the good news is that all the stakeholders in healthcare, that is, the, that is your uh, trainees, your practitioners, uh, your patients, and your healthcare administrative staff, overall have a positive perception of uh, these tools in healthcare. But we are not prepared. More than 90% of trainee doctors in various surveys have said that they have no involvement or no inclusion of artificial intelligence in their curricula. So we are not preparing our future generation. Similarly, the current practitioner feel that they are unprepared and are slightly anxious as these tools are being rolled out. What about clinicians? Clinicians are primarily concerned about the ethical usage of these tools, data security and breach of privacy, personal liability, who is responsible if something goes wrong? Is a machine responsible or is a doctor responsible? How, what about the algorithms? Are they biased? If you have developed a algorithm based on the population in the Western countries, they may not be applicable to say the African countries or even in India. And there are standard of guidelines that do not mention artificial intelligence and these tools in clinical practice. Now, clinical educators like me are concerned about the erosion of clinical skills, depersonalization, and a move away from holistic care. What about patients? Patients are also concerned about privacy and altered patient-physician relationships. But importantly, they want all of us to be part of a hybrid model of decision-making where the man works with the machine together. Recognizing the disruptive effect of these tools in the future, the American Medical Association in 2018 made it an official policy to enhance AI literacy across the continuum of medical education, which means you start from undergraduate and go all the way to current practitioners. And so the AMA encourages all the societies to produce specialty-specific educational modules related to AI. And hopefully, the AIOS and other organizations in India are also doing the same. The ACGME, which is the accredited organization for graduate medical education in the US, did something called a scenario planning, which means experts in healthcare sat together and visualized what healthcare would look like in 2035. And what they predict is quite scary. So they identify technology and data-driven changes to medical profession as a significant challenge for future providers. I can already see this happening in the US where we have a robust electronic medical record and the amount of data that is being generated is far exceeding the capacity of the current providers and physicians to analyze them. And they also predict that these changes would result in escalating complexity of patient care delivery, commoditization of healthcare services, 
increased transparency of data sharing and, uh, and analysis across various systems, and disruption of the current concepts of physician specialty distribution uh, from what we are currently used to. It is imperative that we educate ourselves. So a few years ago, I developed this curriculum primarily for neurologists, but it can be adopted for all ophthalmologists and all other subspecialties. So when we talk of AI literacy, for all of us, it includes these three broad concepts. Number one is a conceptual foundation of AI, which means the basics of data, basics of statistical analysis, and how artificial intelligence differs from your traditional statistics. Number two, clinical applications. So very soon, the vendors are going to be selling you applications based on artificial intelligence and machine learning if they are not already doing that. How are you going to assess if these tools are going to be relevant and important for your clinical practices? How are you going to judge that a device that was developed, say, in the US is going to be applicable to you in your Indian practice? What are the ethical and social impacts of artificial intelligence? Importantly, how does it appear from a liability standpoint? AI and ML technologies are going to change medical education as we know, and some of this is already occurring in the medical institutions, in medical colleges within the US. You now have AI being used for curriculum enhancement, development of pictures, graphics, monographs, and case scenarios. Simulation tools using augmented reality and virtual reality are also coming into vogue and some of the traditional aspects of say dissection and anatomy that we did in our first years of medical school are going out of the way. Another important area where um, AI tools can be used is in patient education. So you can actually connect the electronic medical records and develop patient education materials including monographs and graphics that you can have your patients review. So I end with this slide. This was when I had a busy clinic and I was frustrated reviewing some of my resident notes. And I decided, let me chat with ChatGPT. So I had just seen a patient who was 60 year old, had acute onset of diplopia and left eye pain, and on examination had abduction deficit of the left eye and decreased corneal sensation of the left eye. And I said, okay, ChatGPT, tell me, give me your differentials and what you would do with this patient. So if you look at what ChatGPT told me, this was a far better note than what my resident and my fellow, and I have to acknowledge in a busy clinic I would have done. And this is ChatGPT 3.5, which is an older generation, which had trained on a non-curated data. So a large language model that has been specifically trained on electronic medical records is going to provide a very succinct and relevant information that we might be able to use to provide patient care. So once again, I end by saying, don't fear, the machines are already here. It's just a question of time before either we use them or they replace us. Thank you. So thank you, Sachin. That was, he was the terminator of our session. Uh, that brings us to the end of this and Rashman, Yes, you, uh, Terminator let me be a two. Terminator. Yeah. <laughs> T2 has come, yes. Yeah, so there's a couple of observation and one question to Sachin as to where you stand. So uh, observation one, uh, the problem. We had developed uh, a model where uh, to detect uh, diabetic retinopathy with uh, IIT Madras and the, the sensitivity, the accuracy was 96%, which is very high. But when we implemented it in a clinical setting, we realized that while it did very well, it ended up missing proliferative diabetic retinopathy. So though in statistical term, your accuracy might be very high, but it might miss something which you don't want it to miss. And that's where your ethical problem comes in. Uh, the, the question to you of what you said, in fact, I, I, I had a presentation on chat GPT on APO, which I made on chat GPT. And I realized it was chat GPT neuroophthalmology. And I realized that it ended up missing Andrew Lee's uh, nodal, which is one of yeah. the good resource, but probably it didn't have enough Google hits for it to pick it up. So where do you stand? I mean, if, uh, let's say if you give your resident to write uh, an abstract, and it comes back in one hour with a beautiful abstract, would you allow it or would you not allow it? 
The answer is no. Um, so in fact, at Nanos, we had exactly this session about what is acceptable and what's not. Um, and if you have a student, the student has to first acknowledge that I have used these tools. The student has to tell exactly what they did. Did they ask ChatGPT to produce the whole abstract out of thin air? Or did they provide the information to ChatGPT and said, okay, now just construct it into a relevant abstract, correcting all the spelling mistakes, syntactical errors, and so on. Um, the other thing that we have to recognize is these tools are really in their infancy. I mean, think about your medical student in the first month of their training. You cannot expect them to provide the care that, say, a resident or even a fellow can do. All of these tools are eventually going to reach there. It's just a question of time. All of these tools, the output depends on the data that was used to train it. So if the training data was itself flawed, then your output is going to be flawed. And the studies that you're mentioning, I was a part of a couple of studies where we used convolutional neur neural networks uh, in diagnosing dementia in a large population group the AUC was, it was about 98, 99%. It far exceeded all of the 25 neurologists who were trying to you know, provide the backup data. The, the problem is it, when it is used in that limited setting, it does extremely well. And the real question is what happens when you roll out these tools into clinical practice? So in that neurology study, we came up with, with algorithms, and the next step is to have them be included in, say, a GP or a general practitioner practice to see if it actually works, where you give certain data to that algorithm and see if it can diagnose dementia or not. Time will tell. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for attending our session. We hope you all enjoyed it. and. Uh, Please do give us good feedback. We'll come back next year with another one of these. Okay. Uh, thanks to my coaches also for this. Thank you. If the speakers are here, can you just come up on stage? We'll take a photograph, please.